right so <clears throat> today we'll have a, a demo session so last time we saw that we had some issue with the ansys licenses so what we'll do today is uh, we'll have uh, a, a demo of open form which is an open source software which will allow you to work on your assignment without any hindrance in terms of license constraints okay So this is an introduction to open form which is an open source software and uh, we will be discussing this problem which is called flow past a circular cylinder. It's a very standard external flow, flow problem. So in fluid mechanics you may have seen that we study problems into two categories. One is internal flows where you have walls all around and then you have external flows where there is a boundary layer that uh, forms and then there is uh, a free stream above that. Okay. Uh, it, the, these kind of problems are important in uh, aerodynamics particularly where you have uh, vehicles or uh, these uh, objects which are exposed to uh, free stream flow. So there is a boundary layer that develops and because of that boundary layer developing and because of the pressure distribution that uh, gets, uh, um, that gets uh, generated, uh, we have uh, a drag and sometimes a lift on the body. You may have seen that uh, if you are uh, driving in a vehicle and it is a very aerodynamic vehicle then the amount of drag is much lower than as compared to a bluff body like a big truck. Although the trucks also are quite aerodynamic uh, uh, nowadays but uh, typically the earlier uh, the old trucks that we see on the roads they are quite uh, bluff in that sense. Okay. Uh, so, uh, for studying these kind of problems, uh, we have this uh, very standard benchmark problem of flow past a circular cylinder. So, where you have, it is a two dimensional problem, well the problem, there is a, you can think of extruding this into the third dimension where you have this cylinder with a cross section which is a circle and uh, there is flow happening past this cylinder with some uh, u infinity uh, which is a free stream velocity and then when the flow interacts with the cylinder, there is some boundary layer that develops and there is some uh, change in the pressure um, uh, distribution around the on the surface of the cylinder which results in uh, uh, drag force. So there will be a drag force which combine which has a contribution from form drag which is the pressure drag uh, because of the pressure distribution uh, which is uh, non-symmetric between upstream and downstream and then there is a viscous drag because of the form formation of the boundary layer. We are talking about a viscous fluid here. So when you contribute, when you add the contributions of both these uh, pressure drags and uh, viscous drags, you get the overall drag. And then if the uh, if you talk about the net force on the body, then the force could have components which are not just along the x-axis but also could have a y component. And the y component could be changing with time as well. So that's the y component of force is called. What is that called? lift right. Uh, so uh, then uh, we also have a lift here uh, and typically if you uh, think of um, spacecrafts or, or aer aeroplanes um, you want lift in those bodies because you want the body to rise up. So there we are talking about a lift and then if you are talking about um, high speed uh, aerodynamic cars you want a negative lift, a lift downward so that it get a, gets a better traction on the ground. So we will be studying this problem today using open form. And then in this case uh, you see this animation of this uh, um, alternate vortex shedding and that is a very interesting phenomena we see in this problem where although the free the upstream flow is uh, quite uniform there is no um, unsteady nature of the incoming flow but because of the interaction with the circular cylinder we get an unsteady flow. So you see these vortices being shed downstreams and we will see this uh, in our animations today as well and this vortex shedding phenomena is actually called von Karman vortex street and this actually results in some sort of vibration of the body because the vortex shedding is alternate right. So you see that the pressure distribution also changes with time upstream and downstream. So this, this vortex shedding is non-symmetric about the x-axis. So what we see is that the pressure distribution also changes uh, uh, non-symmetrically about the x-axis. So sometimes you see the force is upwards on the body or the net pressure is upwards, sometimes the net pressure is downwards. So we see some sort of a uh, force on the uh, cylinder because of flow 
which is uh, unsteady. So the cylinder experiences an opposite force. It, I mean, a cylinder uh, experiences that force. So because of that, cylinder will start vibrating with the frequency which is equivalent to the vortex shedding frequency. And this vortex shedding frequency is a function of Reynolds number. So if you change the uh, flow speed, for example, you will see the frequency changing. And this is quite uh, important in uh, applications where you have, for example, bridges. If you have a bridge and there is a wind blowing which is quite steady, but still you see the bridge starts vibrating and the vibration frequency has to be um, you know, quite uh, different from the natural frequency of the bridge, otherwise there will be resonance and the bridge can fail. Okay. There have been actually, there is a Tacoma bridge uh, case, if you google it, YouTube it, you will see uh, a video of a bridge where it starts uh, twisting and then it just collapses. Right, so let us uh, go to the fluid mechanics of the problem. Uh, so we have a standard workflow again like we had in ANSYS. Um, well, it is an open source code but it still is following the same uh, ideas. So we have to make a geometry and then there is a mesh involved with the geometry. I forgot to write it this time as well. And then we have uh, boundary conditions and solver settings that we have to set. Uh, then we run the solver which is actually the mostly uh, most time taking task because we are solving the equations uh, using uh, some uh, linear equation solvers. Uh, then uh, we have, uh, once we have the data in terms of the values of velocities and pressures at uh, different points in the domain at different times, then we can do post processing depending on what we want to analyze. So if you want shear stresses, you want the lift coefficient or drag coefficient as a function of time, you can get all those new things. So we will see, um, we will also plot the results today. So OpenFORM is an open source software, so no license is needed for running simulations. Although the license uh, could uh, hinder you from selling it, the different kinds of open source licenses and depending on which license uh, open source uh, the OpenFORM has, but you can definitely install it on your machine and run problems um, and uh, analyze the data. Okay? It does not require you to pay to get that license, it is free. Uh, in fact, it is open source, so what that means is the software is not just free, it is open source. The source code which is, uh, you know, I mean the, the actual source code which is used for developing the software is also available for free. So it is, that is the uh, you know, ultimate level of uh, freedom in uh, software that uh, you can actually modify it and people do that depending on your requirement, their requirement, they uh, just go to the source code of the software, you have to understand that, it is a bit intricate, but if you understand it then you can make changes to the code. And then you can compile it and the whole software can run with this new modified features. Okay, so there are three levels. One is a commercial software where you have to pay for the license. There is an executable that is given to you. One is a free software where you have an executable available for free. And then there is open source where you have the source code available for free. So you can compile and generate the executable yourself. Okay, so please check their website. It is uh, quite uh, well managed. So you can uh, figure out which OS you have and you can download uh, the necessary executable. If you want, you can download the source code and compile from scratch as well depending on what you want. Okay, uh, and uh, nowadays you also have these containerized versions like dockers and so on. So you can run them uh, without installing the actual software on your machine. You can use, uh, like we use virtual machines. So you can download a file, a large uh, file which could be of uh, know, 7 to 10 gigabytes in size, but then you can readily launch the software using that file. Now it may not be, uh, the executable generated may not be optimized for your ar system architecture of your computer. That is the reason when you run it on HPCs, we tend to download the source code and compile it so that the compiler on the uh, cluster will uh, compile uh, the code which is, uh, which, which suits the architecture of the machine. So these ideas will be discussed in an advanced course called High Performance Scientific Computing which is offered next semester uh, because uh, you just do not want to uh, run um, things uh, non-optimally. Okay? So there is, when you, when you when you are a computational scientist uh, or a computational engineer, you also have to understand the, uh, some sort of hardware of the machine. You just cannot write a code and then expect it to run fast, it also has to be optimized for the hardware that you are running it on. So nowadays you do not have to write the code in that way, you have to write the code in a standard way, but the compilers on that uh, hardware will make sure that it communicates most effectively with the software that you have written. But these ideas are a bit advanced, but they actually help you save a lot of time if you know them. Uh, then uh, there is a typo in the third, uh, it is Linux. So Linux virtual machine is prepared for this class. Uh, an IIT Mundi cloud link will be shared on uh, Google Drive where you have the codes shared. You can download this compressed uh, file 
from IIT Mandi cloud and then you can extract it and then you can run the virtual machine that we will be running today in this class. Uh, the username password is given so you can, uh, so the software is installed there, you do not have to install anything for your uh, initial exercise to save uh, time. Uh, all you need is a virtual box uh, version 6 or above which will be able to um, run the virtual machine. And you can also run this on the HPC cluster using something called singularity containers which are available on the HPC cluster of IIT Mundi and the instructions are again available on the website of IIT Mundi to how to run open foam there. It's a very standard software uh, for uh, fluid mechanics. And remember open foam is a solver. Okay, so it uh, is uh, not, it does not have a preprocessor. It has to some extent, uh, uh, but uh, you can also use other preprocessors. So you can generate and we will be doing that, we will be generating a mesh, uh, we will be generating a geometry and a mesh in a separate software which has nothing to do with open foam and then we will be converting the output of that mesh that we get from the uh, open source software called gmesh. Uh, we will be converting that mesh uh, format to a format that open foam can understand. So somebody has uh, open foam uh, has written a script where it converts the standard gmesh output format to an open foam readable format. So we will run that script to convert that uh, database from gmesh output to open foam readable input and once you have the output of open foam which is again going to be uh, uh, binary uh, data in the form of uh, lots of uh, um, arrays and so on and then uh, we can read them in uh, some other open source software which is uh, optimized for uh, opening large data sets and uh, plotting things on the screen and uh, visualizing okay so this so, so that we are able to pick uh, the best um, options available for uh, preprocessors which are mesh uh, geometry and mesh generation and post processors which are for visualizing and analyzing outputs. Right, so let us uh, jump into it. For this I um, will have to start the virtual machine. So I have got this uh, virtual machine already set up on my machine but uh, you can download it from the cloud link. There will be a file, you double click it, uh, it will automatically open in this uh, virtual machine. So while it is uh, loading, let us uh, Right, so the first step uh, is to make a geometry. So what I will do is uh, So I'm using the. Uh, okay, uh, it seems that this doesn't work. Right. Anyways. Uh, right. So. Uh, Gmesh is the software we will be using for, uh, just making sure it is, um, yeah. so we cannot make a full screen because the recording will not work properly, that is okay. Uh, so I hope you can read this. So Gmesh uh, is an open source uh, software that we will be using to generate the geometry. So I will be following these uh, steps to generate uh, the geometry today. So let us open a terminal, zoom into it a bit and then, um, 
sorry. So, we are in our home. So, let us uh, make a directory on the desktop. We will just call it uh, open form demo. Okay. And then I will make a geometry for uh, make a directory for geometry. And it is taking a lot of space. So, what I will do is I will uh, Okay, so uh, we have uh, we are in uh, this folder called geometry. We'll be we'll be working. So I'll open uh, launch the GMesh software, which you launch it using GMesh GMSH command. It's already installed in the uh, virtual machine. And now uh, it's a bit uh, small in text. Uh, let's see if we can increase. I think I uh, let's see. I'm trying to increase the font size. Yeah, is it better now? Right, it is uh, much more read because we need to read these options. Uh, so, the first step is uh, going to be uh, to generate the domain. So, uh, we want a cylinder and then we want a domain around it because ultimately the flow has to happen inside a domain. It cannot, although it is an external flow problem, but we have to put the flow inside a box so that we can run the, uh, we can generate a mesh uh, corresponding to that. So, the flow will happen between the region of the outside box and the circle. Inside the circle is all solid. So, the fluid region is between the outside box and the circle. So, the cylinder is going to be one uh, well uh, unit in diameter. I will set the units later. Let us say let us say one meter in diameter. It is a bit large, but that is okay. And then the domain will be uh, 15 units long and 10 units wide. Um, and the center of the circle is going to be at two units from the left. Okay. So, these are just uh, dimensions uh, that we will be needing. So, first you go to the geometry. And then you say uh, you want uh, to add an elementary entity and we then we have to add those points. So, we will go bottom to top approach where you start with points, make lines, from lines you make uh, closed loops and from there you make surfaces then you make volumes. Okay, this is called a bottom top approach. This is a top bottom approach where you start with standard surfaces, you take union or intersection of those things and you make a geometry. It is uh, much uh, uh, more uh, intuitive to start with a bottom top approach. Okay, um, so, now it says uh, I have to add points. So, uh, first I will add uh, 0, 0, 0. So, it is a 2D geometry. So, we will be starting with Z coordinate is going to be 0 and you can ignore this prescribed mesh size uh, for now. Okay, uh, then we add. So, it has added one point which is 0, 0, 0. Then we want the uh, outside rectangle. So, we will just move the x axis to uh, 15, y stays at 0. So, now it is added another point. Now, I want to go up. So, I go up 10 and then I have to go back which is uh, I have to go y equal to 0. Right. Sorry, uh, it is the uh, top left point. So, that is uh, x equal to 0 and y equal to 10. Okay, so, now we can see it has added 4 points. One is 0, 0, one is uh, 0, 15, the other is uh, 15, 10 and the other is uh, 0, 10. So, I am just following the instructions. So, uh, first I have to add points, then I have to make lines out of it. So, let us do that. So, for line I will have to um, join points, let us say select start point. So, I will select this one. As you select it becomes uh, slightly solid. It says now uh, select the end point. So, the end point is this. So, that 
makes it a line. You can see this blue color now. So that's uh, so now I can say uh, now I can continue or I can quit. So I want to continue. So I'll start with this point, and then click this one. That's as simple as this. And then select this and select this. So now it's made uh, a box. Uh, next, what I do is I have made the lines now. So next, I have to make a circle. So for circle, I have to uh, well, the different ways. Uh, so the uh, one I like the best is uh, first I'll put a point. So let's put points. So the center is uh, at x equal to two, and y equals to five. Okay. So this is uh, now you can see the center of the circle, and then um, I need uh, points. I'll be making four arcs to make a circle. So uh, the bottom point on the arc is going to have the same x axis, but the y is going to be 4.5. And then I need uh, a right point. So for that, the x coordinate becomes 2.5 and the y coordinate is 5. Okay. So I'll just add four points and make an arc out of it. Next is the top point where the x coordinate is uh, 5 and the y coordinate is, sorry, uh, x coordinate is 2 and y coordinate is 5.5 right and then uh, the left one is x equals 1.5 and y is equal to 5 and by the way if you make a mistake you can always delete it it's no problem with that right uh, so we have uh, made this uh, these points now uh, you can ignore this error message for now we'll uh, visit it later Usually it's uh, good to have a look at it, um, but for now mm -hmm. let's ignore it. So next, uh, since we have made the points, now we'll be making a circle using four curves or four arcs. So for that, I have to say a circle, select this option circle, circle arc, and then it says select the start point. So this is the start point. Then it says select center point. Then I select the center of the circle. And then it says select the end point, which is this one, and then it makes an arc out of it. Okay. Similarly, I just uh, follow this process uh, multiple times, but um, there is uh, an easier way uh, for uh, pro users. You can actually go to this option uh, which says edit script. So while you are doing things, it is generating a text script corresponding to that. So that if you want to make a change, you can make a change to the script and run it. So I can uh, click this and then it shows a script corresponding to this, all these steps I am following. So I, I do not have to press buttons, I can copy paste commands as well. So it uh, has four points the four points I had, it, then it had four lines. So line number one as a, was from points one and two. So points one and two, that was uh, the bottom left and the uh, bottom right. Then you have line number two, three and four. So we had four lines. Then we made these points, point five was the center. You can see the coordinates, two comma five comma zero. And then uh, we made a circle number five, which is from uh, point number six, which was the bottom point. Then the center was point number five and point number seven was this. So I can literally uh, you know, just copy and paste this. So I have four arcs now. I just have to change the uh, number. So this is circle number six, this is seven, this is eight. And then uh, for this, I'm starting with point seven and then going to point eight with the same uh, center. And then I start with point eight, go to point nine. And then I start with point 0.9 and go to point number 6 back. That's it. So then I save it and then I can, so I did a control S and then um, I go back here and then I can say reload script. And uh, now you can see that it's been able to then it done. So you see, we can do things much uh, quicker uh, this way. Okay. And usually when I do it myself, I do not even open Gmesh. I open a text file and I start writing. Because when you get used to it, it is much easier to type things rather than pressing buttons with a mouse. You tend to work without a mouse. It is much quicker. Because you have already drawn things. I, I draw it on a piece of paper, write all the coordinates and things. And I have a list of steps to do. And then you can very quickly write commands in a text file. But again, that depends on uh, your comfort. But then if you have a large uh, geometry, if you write everything and there is an error, it is difficult to find out. So always good to you know start writing here. Save it, reload, save it, reload, so that if you write something which is wrong, it can, it will give you an error at the bottom saying that there is some problem with this geometry. So you can figure out where the, it will give you a line number also. So it is sort of, you know, compiling your commands into a um, Gmesh uh, figure. Right, uh, so let us uh, move on. So this, uh, we have been able to make a circle with four curves. Now we have to create a plane. 
So, for that uh, what we will do is uh, we will say uh, plane surface here and then uh, it says select surface boundary. So, this is this boundary, but then it says select whole boundaries. So, we have a hole in this plane because this circle that you have it is actually a solid. So, there is no flow happening inside it. So, if we select this whole boundary. Uh, so, what it does is it will automatically understand that you are trying to find a form a plane which has this outer boundary minus this circle and then it says uh, then E to end selection. So, then I press E and now you can see that it has drawn this uh, dotted lines, but what I tend to do is I go back to the script again and now you see that uh, well reload. So, you can see that we had till this point, but now it has generated 3 more lines. So, first what it does is it generates a curved loop with 3, 4, 1 and 2. Uh, which is uh, uh, lines uh, 3, 4, 1 and 2 is a curved loop and then it has a curved loop 2 which is 7, 8, 5 and 6 which is this 7, 8, 5 and 6 the 4 arcs basically a circle and then it says the surface is 1 minus 2. So, 1 was this outer box and 2 is the inner circle. So, using the 4 arcs it has been able to form one curved loop and then you find you define the plane as outer loop minus inner loop. So, that is how you specify. So, if you the first one is the outer one, the second one is all the things you want to subtract out of it. Is that clear? It is always good to save it uh, somewhere else because what happens is, is untitled.go is the standard name. So, if it crashes for some reason it will open a fresh one and it may have deleted this uh, preliminary file. So, it is always good to save it. Um, now, we generated uh, on the desktop we have this uh, okay it's, gen it's generating here so that's okay but i would really want to save it uh, with the name uh, which is different from untitled so let's call it uh, circle and now just to because it's opening untitled let's quit it so now i'll say it actually would have untitled as well. So, let us open uh, gmesh with circle.go and I can read the script of circle as well. So, now it is opening circle.go. So, I know which file I am working with. Right, uh, is it clear till now? Okay. Well, we are recording this if you, we have to repeat things you can easily and there is a lot of uh, help available on the internet as well. And uh, next is uh, we have to extrude. Because uh, the way open form works is although you are working with a 2D problem, but open form tends to work with 3D uh, problems in a general sense. So, if you want to work with a 2D what you do is you extrude with just one volume in the z direction because you know open finite volume works with the center of the volume. right? So, you extrude in the z direction and you say that I want to extrude with just one volume. So, what will happen is that it will only have one unit of volume in the z direction and that is how open form works otherwise other software can deal with a 2D problem uh, directly, but that is just uh, open forms uh, uh, requirement. So, what we do is uh, we will say elementary entities uh, extrude and then we will say translate. So, you have to, we have to translate in the uh, z direction. So, I will just uh, translate uh, uh, one mesh layer uh, with the one unit in. So, dz is one unit and then uh, we have to select the entities. So, let us select oops, actually I want to select a plane so earlier it was not showing so I have to uh, go to options and show the plane. So, this is a plane so I want to extrude the whole plane. So, then I select the plane and then uh, E to end, so then I press E and then uh, well, it is done. So, Q to abort. So, now I can put my mouse here and then uh, rotate it. Now, you can see it is extruded it. Okay. Earlier it was a 2D geometry, but now it is a 3D. So, there is some shortcut options available from which I can snap it back to a 2D. So, I can control, alt and click, but these things you can find out uh, from their help. Right. So, this is uh, now the geometry we have. And then we can look at the script as well. So, what it has done is uh,
So it's added this uh, command extrude uh, 0, 0, 001 surface 1. Okay. So let us uh, see what is next and by the way sometimes I start with a geometry file which is already there for some other geometry. So that closest problem I can find and then I just tweak that that is much easier sometimes rather than starting from scratch. And then we have to mesh it, extrude actually um, let me check. Uh, I already have uh, the folder structure uh, for the demo. So, So I already uh, no, practiced this at home. Uh, so let me show you the, um, so in extrude uh, typically you also want to, uh, so you uh, specify the surface number, so extrude has a surface number 1, in my case I had surface number 2, physical surface was called 2, so we have a 2 here. You also have to specify the number of layers in this recombine option. I am not sure if it works without it, but uh, given that uh, we did not have, don't have enough time, so I do not want to try things. So I am just copying this layers and recombine uh, from the earlier file I have because I uh, think that it is required for this extrude option to work. Right, uh, so now we will mesh it, I will go back to the circle.go. So let us do it, so let us uh, go to mesh option here, geometry is done. Then uh, the meshing, the way it works is you mesh lines or uh, edges then you from those edges you generate surface mesh, from surface mesh you generate volume mesh. Like you want to uh, mesh a surface, what you do is you put some points on the line and then you put some points on the line then you connect those uh, points in the x and y axis. So this is how it works, so press first you press 1D, so it says done meshing 1D, then you press 2D, so now you can see some meshes being generated, colour is not that good enough but you can still see some triangles on the screen. Let us see if you can option, you can change the colors. But anyways, uh, and then uh, what we will do is, it is now it has meshed the all the surfaces front, back and the top, uh, bottom, left, right. So now what I will do is, I will uh, press the uh, 3D. And then what it does is it generates a mesh inside. So you can't really see it, but uh, if you haven't meshed 3D, then what the meshes, your triangles you see are only on the surfaces. There is no internal mesh in the three dimensions, okay, the, uh, still hollow inside. So once you press 3D, so 1D, 2D, 3D, that is typically what we do. So it has meshed it. Now uh, sometimes you want to control the mesh size and so on. Uh, in this case, uh, we will want to do it. Uh, so uh, we want to refine the mesh. So one thing you can do is you can change the element size and options. Uh, the other thing you can, you can do is if you remember when we generated this, uh, these points, every point had this uh, thing called 1.0, that is a characteristic length associated with every point. So that is the characteristic length of the mesh. So what we are saying is all the, whatever point we defined, we had a corresponding mesh size with that point. So we are saying that uh, the mesh size is 1.0. So all the triangles will have typically a side which is equal to 1.0. That is a bit coarse, at, at least uh, near the surface of the cylinder. So what I will do is the points which were used to define the cylinder, points 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9, I will call this 0 0.1. and save. So now what we will do is we will uh, now that uh, no, we have to mesh it again because we have reloaded re the script. So 1D, 2D, so now you can see that it is much finer around here and then you can press 3D. 
this generated uh, 3D mesh. Right. So, you can see this uh, fine mesh. You can do a lot about uh, 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 controlling the uh, size of the mesh and so on, uh, but for now uh, this is enough. You want to move on to solve the problem. Now, okay. This is a pit course in the sense that the results we will get will not be as accurate as we expect, but it is a good starting point. Typically in CFD what you do is you do not start with a very fine mesh, otherwise what happens is that you will be spending a lot of time uh, to run that one case, but that may have problems in it. The good thing about CFD is it works for coarse meshes as well except that the results will be less accurate. That is the whole idea of truncation error, right? convergence. Uh, so as and when you refine the mesh size, accuracy increases. So that means you can start with a coarse one, get a result which is quite inaccurate, but still it will follow the same trend and then you can start refining it and then you will see the results will get much more accurate. Okay, so I think uh, that is it. Uh, uh, we did not do this, so I will, so we just refined the mesh around the circle using mesh defined size. Uh, the, you can do these options by changing that 1 to 0 0.1 using some buttons on the G mesh, but I did it directly from the text file. Okay. Um, so we just uh, refined the mesh around circle, so just say using this option or you can uh, change the uh, characteristic length for points making the circle in dot uh, geo file. Okay. Then uh, you have to uh, generate physical surfaces with names because you would want to have boundary conditions. So you have to name the boundaries. Um, so for that uh, we will go back to gmesh. And then uh, we say physical groups add a surface. So let's uh, like this. Okay. Uh, so now uh, let's uh, start with one surface, which is uh, we'll call uh, inlet. So in, and then uh, you have to select this surface. So you can see it's this red line. So that surface has been selected. Press E to end selection, uh, and it's done. So next uh, I want uh, outlet, so which is out, press the out surface, E to end selection, then uh, to make a bottom surface, which is this one, and then top. So wherever I have to specify boundary condition, I will uh, generate those surfaces. And then I need uh, this circle because I will have to have a no slip on this wall or because it is a solid boundary, right? So I will call it a circle. Then select this uh, surface. Well, I have to select four of these because so now it is the complete circle being selected. And then press E to end selection. And then I uh, since open foam requires a three solves things as 3D, so it requires a front and a back as well. So for that I will call uh, front back and then you select the front and you select the back and then you press E and that should do it. And now I can go back to my uh, edit script, reload. And now we can see that uh, after that extrude, it has added this physical surface uh, called in. It also has a number. Some software will require a name. Some will require a number to identify that boundary. And then this is equal to uh, uh, this uh, surface 20. We do not have to worry about these numbers. These numbers are more important if you have to deal with the surface. But uh, open foam can take these names. So that is okay. okay. So that is pretty much it. Uh, you have physical surfaces. You also have to add, add a physical volume um, for uh, the surface, uh, for, for the geometry to be um, complete. So for that uh, we just say add a volume and then we say just call it volume. I just select this volume, so that is a sphere press E to end selection and quit. So now you can see the script. It should have something called a physical volume called volume which is this. 
okay. I will check with my geometry which worked. So, you can see that we had physical surfaces and then we had this volume, I called it internal, this time we called it volume. The numbers are different but that is okay. So, this is just a geometry, it has no information about the mesh, it is simply a geometry. When you mesh it, it will generate uh, this mesh file which has details of uh, the meshes. Uh, so, for that uh, you can generate the mesh in uh, Gmesh and save it or what you can do is, sorry, here and this uh, circle.geo or what we can do is I can just write Gmesh with the circle.geo and a minus 3. So, minus 3 uh, basically means you generate a mesh out of this geometry and when you run it, uh, it does something meshing lines curve and so on and then uh, it stopped and there is no error. So, now you can see that this uh, circle dot msh which is a mesh which is larger in size because it has details of all the things is generated. I can actually open this uh, circle dot mesh and then see it has uh, because a mesh contains information about all the mesh nodes how they are connected and so on. So, this has some standard uh, format which lots of uh, point IDs and so on. You do not have to worry about that, but that is generated, that is a good thing. Just to check I can open gmesh circle dot mesh and this will open the mesh file, only the mesh file and I can see that the mesh looks good. Uh, we can go to tools uh, options and then uh, for the uh, mesh I can have uh, labels. So, I can uh, say that I want uh, the uh, physical group tags which are the numbers I gave and now you can see that it is actually telling me that this is the boundary 53 um, okay uh, so this is uh, these numbers are available in case I want to find the numbers for the boundary but we are working with the IDs, so which is fine. Sometimes you have somebody else's mesh that you want to understand, so you can open it like this. Right, uh, pretty good. Um, okay, so, we spend a lot of time generating the mesh and typically that happens, a user's time gets spent a lot, a lot of time gets spent from the user in terms of generating meshes and then running the software, well software running will take time, but setting it up is not that much of a time. And then uh, actually uh, we have to save this in a version which is uh, version 2. So, by default it saves in a higher version, but open foam can only read a version 2. So, for that what I have to do is I have to go back, there is a command to save it in a version 2, uh, but uh, easiest thing is I will let me uh, delete the circle.msh and then I will open uh, gmesh again dot on uh, circle.geo and this time I will generate the mesh myself and then I will say file save mesh export and then you can uh, say that you want an msh file. So, we will call it circle dot mesh, it will uh, replace it, but that is ok. Now, here I will say version 2 sky. So, we can figure out a command uh, to uh, generate that version 2, but that is ok for now. Uh, so, we have generated um, the circle.msh again and I can um, actually open it. So, it is some version 2.2 which is I think version 2, okay. but anyways if it is not version 2, uh, this uh, open form will throw an error. Right, uh, so let us go to the next slide. So, now what we have to do is we have to uh, ready our folder structure. Now, it is not like ANSYS where uh, you have a GUI available to press buttons, you have to set your open stu uh, folder structure. So, for that uh, what we do is we start with an example which is uh, a working example. So, if you go to open uh, foam tutorials. So, open form is installed in the uh, OPT folder. So, uh, typically it will have a folder called tutorials. So, I can go to tutorials 
and then here it will tell me all kind of tutorials. So I want a tutorial of incompressible flow and then here it has all the options. I want an incompressible solver. So I can go to this icofoam. There's other uh, solvers available, but we'll not worry about that right now. And then you have this lid driven cavity problem that's already there. That's the closest problem I have. So I can simply go to this uh, um, cavity problem. It has some folders here. So I can go to this cavity folder here and it has this open foam structure here. So all I want to do is I want to copy this uh, cavity folder. So I'll, you can do it from uh, GUI as well. I'll just say copy um, recursively um, cavity folder and I want to copy it on uh, the desktop uh, in the open foam uh, demo folder I just uh, created. Okay. So now if I go to this uh, open foam demo folder, then this cavity has been copied. Uh, now what you have to, uh, the instructions are there in the uh, text, uh, this uh, PowerPoint. I simply have to copy this physical properties file and bring it out of the constant folder and I have to delete this constant folder. Because see this time we are generating mesh using Gmesh. So we have to do these uh, tweaks. And then uh, what I will do is I will copy this uh, geometry, the mesh file I have circle.msh and I will copy it into this cavity folder structure. Now we will be working with this structure. We have everything we need. Okay, so I will go back uh, to the uh, open foam, uh, sorry. So we will, I will go to the cavity folder now that I have and here I have this circle.msh. So I have to convert this into a gmesh format. So for that there is a command which is called uh, gmesh to foam. So I have to write uh, gmesh to foam and then this circle.msh and then it does something and it generates, uh, well, everything is good. If there was an error, you could see it. And now if I do an ls minus l, this constant folder is generated again. Right. So now uh, I can go back to here. The constant folder is there. It has some mesh details. Then I can copy this physical properties, uh, cut and paste back to the constant folder. Uh, next is uh, to check the physical properties. So let's open this file and all it has is uh, my kinematic viscosity which is 0.01. I'm happy with that value. So let's close it. Uh, the next thing we have to do is uh, in the boundary file, we have this uh, boundaries now, front, back, top, in, bottom, out and circle. So all these things that we set. So here uh, what we have to do is we have to make some changes. Uh, uh, so it says on uh, edit boundary file, circle, top, bottom wall are the all type walls. So uh, basically uh, these are instead of type patch, you will call it a type wall. Okay, and I have to delete this uh, physical type option here. I have to do it uh, for uh, the boundaries where there are walls, you can call it walls. The boundaries where you have to specify something other than a wall condition, you can keep it a patch. Uh, so let's, uh, so front back, I think is also a patch. Front back is empty, sorry. So uh, front back uh, we keep as empty. So it's a, uh, 2D problem, so we will uh, keep it empty. Top stays a wall, in stays a patch, physical type has to be removed. Uh, bottom becomes a wall, out stays a patch because at the outlet we will uh, be uh, applying some sort of a outlet condition, outflow condition and the circle is actually a wall because the circle surface, uh, the sur surface of that circle is a solid body, so it is a wall then I save it. Okay. So this is one uh, tweak that you have to do. And then uh, we have to edit these uh, files which are called P and U in the zero folder. So the zero folder that gets generated in uh, this uh, uh, folder called system, sorry uh, not system, uh, the zero folder that we have here, it has two files P and U. So these are the initial and boundary condition for pressure and velocity. Uh, so for pressure, now you can see that uh, I copied it from somewhere else, this structure. So it has uh, the boundary names from that structure. So what I have to do is, uh, I have to, um, I need these boundary names. So I will just uh, copy this all. 
So rather than deleting things, I'll just uh, paste it here. So you can see the way it works is it says the uh, boundary name, type, and then the boundary condition you want here. Okay. So the boundary name I have front and back. So front and back uh, is uh, type empty. It uh, tells us on the PowerPoint that uh, on the front and back you have type empty. On the walls you always have a zero gradient of pressure. We saw that, right? So on the walls we'll have because it's a Dirichlet for velocity, so it's a Neumann for pressure. So zero gradient on walls, and for the outlet it's a Dirichlet for pressure. So we'll call it a fixed value. All right. So I'm doing things very quickly, but this video will be available, so you can uh, follow it at your own pace. So on the top we have uh, type wall, sorry, a uh, type uh, uh, zero gradient. So it's already there here. So I can remove this just to make sure that I uh, otherwise it will throw an error. There's nothing like uh, these boundaries. So front and back are empty. And moving wall, uh, well, this is not there here. Okay, uh, so top is a zero gradient. Inlet is uh, a zero gradient as well. Then bottom is a zero gradient as well. Outlet is a fixed value, but then what value we have to specify that as well. Sorry. So let us go here. So, um, outlet is a, a fixed value on the outlet with a value of uniform 0. So, we the way we specify that is we say value. And again, you can check some other uh, you know, folder structure and see how it's done, or you can see the help. Uh, and then the, we say uniform zero. So it says that the value is zero, the outlet pressure, because it's a reference pressure, right? So it's all zero on the outlet and uniformly. And the circle is again, it's a wall, so it's uh, zero gradient. Okay, so that's it for the pressure. This is dimension of uh, pressure, so you, uh, m, l, t, and so on. So you don't, do, and this is initial condition. Initial condition is also uniformly zero everywhere. So this is done. Now let's uh, go to velocity. Now for the velocity, what I'll do is I'll just copy this uh, because this is what we want actually here. So I'll copy it. So on the front and back it's type empty, which is fine. So it's always good to see how they are specified in a standard. So on walls you say no slip. Okay, so I'll just copy it from this older structure that we had. Uh, so top is a wall, inlet is not a wall, leave it. Bottom is uh, a wall, outlet is uh, um, an outflow condition, circle is a wall. Okay. And then uh, for uh, the uh, inlet, I have to specify fixed value because it's a Dirichlet. And the value in this case we are specifying is a uniform velocity of 1 meters per second. So that's how you specify. So x, y, z. So it's an x direction. I think uh, on the outlet you can just uh, leave it. But we can check. So no slip on walls, front and back are empty and then uh, on the inlet you specify um, uh, uniform and actually outlet is zero gradient. Right. It's del u by del x equal to zero, so that's a zero gradient on the velocity for the outlet. Is that clear? And run, uh, we can run this uh, check mesh command to make sure uh, things are okay with the mesh. So I can go back to here. So I am in the main folder structure of cavity that I have set now. And then I can say uh, check mesh and it says mesh okay. So 
that is uh, pretty much it that I need for now. Next is solvers, it is not much we have to set in the solvers, uh, physical properties we already have set, the value of uh, kinematic viscosity is fine. Then we have to go to this file called control dict and there we have to change the time. So from where, from starting from t equal to 0 to what time you want to set, what is delta t and so on. Uh, so we can set that uh, in this folder called control dictionary. So you go to system and then you have this control dictionary and here it says uh, the application we are using is icofoam which is incompressible flow uh, solver. Starting time is uh, 0, end time is 0 0.5 and delta t is 0 0.005. So that means it will take a total of uh, 100 time steps right to reach to this point. And then um, other things we can uh, ignore for now because I really want to run it and show you the next steps. So uh, now we simply have to type icofoam and run it, done, very quick, uh, it's, uh, it's very coarse mesh, it runs very quickly. And then I can go to this uh, folder structure and then see that it has generated this uh, 0 0.1 to 0.5, so corresponding to each time it has uh, output files. So I can now uh, just open another window and I can write uh, this uh, thing called parafoam which is for post processing so just look at 2D. So you can see that uh, it uh, shows me this uh, and then I have to look at let us say the velocity this is at t equal to 0 then I go to the last time step and I can see that something has happened. Um, just scale the values and then I can actually play it. So it has only 5 uh, steps, so it, it is starting to generate but it looks alright. I can um, plot uh, these glyphs which are these vectors, uh, um, so I can just So now um, I can just say orientation is with the velocity and then uh, just scale it down a bit to 1.0, actually scale it with the velocity that makes more sense and then the colouring has to be solid colour and now I can uh, zoom into it and you can see that the uh, flow is starting to turn up and then it is turning there. But you still cannot see the uh, vortex shading because you need to uh, run it for a longer time. Okay. Is that clear? So good, it, so it works fine. So what I do now is I go back, uh, well open the control dict and here I can say I am happy with this so I can now run it till 50 seconds. Okay, save it, go back to this and type icofoam and now you just have to wait until it generates everything but uh, you do not really have to wait, you can actually start post processing while it is running. So run paraform, apply, it is uh, run till a time of uh, 226, uh, well uh, 22.6 seconds that is what it shows here on the top, uh, 2D, go to velocity, velocity magnitude. So now uh, we can see that uh, it is uh, starting to generate. We still do not see any vortex shedding. Sometimes when your mesh is very coarse, uh, it, it cannot even resolve the vortex uh, being shed. But it does work. I mean, uh, if you run it for a longer time, in fact, uh, it, de it does depend on the Reynolds number as well, right? So let us uh, right click it and say uh, reload files. It may have uh, run it for a longer time now. Yeah, so now it is completed and in fact I can see some sort of a recirculation uh, here, okay. So if I run it from uh, 400, so 40 seconds onwards, so now we will be able to see some sort of a vortex shedding. Can you see this? If the mesh was fine, it will actually look quite beautiful and uh, you can actually change that uh, speed at which animation is running and so on, so it, it works fine. Uh, but again these things can be done uh, by yourself. So you can look at the mesh here, it is pretty coarse. Uh, so if you, ha you have to put more data point, that is how you know um, iterate 
you say that uh, you know what I have to put more data points in the downstream because I see some vortex shading starting to happen. To resolve those vortices I have to put more points downstream as well. So these things you learn uh, from, exp uh, from the experience of the problem. And then uh, I can actually uh, plot the glyphs here just the way we plotted to see uh, some sort of uh, um, this. So I can just you know, play around with this uh, go to 400 and then uh, you can see these uh, arrows going up, it is pretty coarse mesh. If it was finer I could have actually got uh, very uh, interesting results but you can see what is happening. Okay. Uh, let us see if there is any. I have shown you U magnitude and glyphs, glyphs are these vector plots. Um, notice the vortex shedding. Um, animation uh, of uh, velocity magnitude can be uh, generated, so you can generate these uh, video files, you can play them, uh, they look very good in presentations. You can actually plot uh, the pressure um, downstream at some point and see the oscillations uh, as well uh, of pressure because all the variables will be oscillating. So let us delete these glyphs. So what I can do is I can say I want to probe a location um, and then it tells me the pressure there. So which location I want to probe, I can uh, simply uh, I can go to surface with because the values are available on these points, nodal points. So I have to select one of these. So I can then say go to probe location and I want uh, let us say this point. So I can control P, so that starts probing this, so there is a this probe location is probing this point, you can see the value of U and P at this point. And then what I say is uh, I will want to plot data over time at this location. So now I can, I have clicked probe location, I can say uh, filters, so plot data over time enter and yes. Now it will uh, run through all the file, uh, files and now you can see that it is showing me the, velocity, uh, the value of pressure and velocity magnitude both at this point as a function of time. You can clearly see these oscillations now. You can actually extract the oscillation frequency also here because that frequency is important. Sometimes all the, the overall output you want from this exercise is this um, frequency. Okay, there is one more thing I want to discuss, it is actually quite uh, interesting for uh, researchers. So those who want to leave can leave, we are recording this, you can look at it later. Okay, um, so this uh, sometimes what you want is you do not want to do things manually in paraview. So let us say I, I, I would want to extract only one thing from this which is the frequency of oscillation, that is all you want. You do not want to play around with mouse options and so on. So what you do is you write a script, in that script it will run, you already have a mesh, right? It will run the problem, generate these files and then it will run some other Python script which will post process the data in such a way so that it has the information about the um, frequency available as a number, as an output in some file. All you want is that number. Then you can you know, keep changing the uh, geometry parameters. You can actually play a, play a lot around with scripts. So if you have a parameter to control in the geometry like the size of the cylinder and that, that is what the exercise is going to be. Different people will work on uh, different shapes of what. Some will get an ellipse, some will get, I uh, will give you what shape you have. Some will get a flat plate like this, some will get a plate like this, some will get an aerofoil. So depending on what geometry you get, you will have to run this on that and then you will see that the drags will be different, diff will be different and so on, okay. So for that uh, what we do is uh, we have to generate, uh, we have to uh, let us say compute the frequency and the corresponding non-dimensional number is called Struhal number, that is a non-dimensional frequency of oscillation. You want the drag and lift coefficients, that is typically you want from as mechanical engineers. Uh, so how do we plot this externally? Uh, so for that uh, open foam allows you, let me close this. Open foam um, allows you to uh, calculate the uh, pressure overall forces on the bodies that you have. Okay. So for that uh, what we do is uh, we go back to our uh, system folder. So in this uh, 
the control dictionary file that I have, I have to modify it. So I will show you how we modify it. I already have it uh, somewhere else. So you simply have to add these uh, functions. Uh, one is called forces, one is called force coefficients. That th these are available in uh, OpenFORM help, and then you have to uh, copy it into your control dictionary. So we just copy it here. So here uh, we are saying that the uh, boundary on which we want to calculate uh, the forces or the coefficients is called circle. So it's on the circle boundary that you have. You save it, and then we go back and we have to. Run it again. So you have to be in this folder uh, to run, and now it runs. So this time, what we'll see is it will generate an extra file that will have information about the um, uh, lift and drag coefficients as well as the, and from there you can extract the frequency of oscillation. So now if I go to the folder structure here, um, it is still running, uh, but it should have generated this folder called post processing. So now it is complete. So you can see that sum of all forces, pressure force, viscous force, um, you can ignore that and then you have this uh, coefficient of lift, coefficient of drag and so on, they are also available on an average and local values are also available in uh, a file which is in this post processing folder. It has this force coefficients, you can go here and it will have as a function of time you have this lift and drag coefficients. I do not want to read these uh, individually. Uh, what I do is uh, I uh, we tend to write scripts in Python. Uh, so I should have it somewhere here. So I have this, uh, these uh, scripts, Python scripts, one is called plots, the other is called struhal. So I will simply um, copy it into my structure here. So uh, you can actually look at this uh, plots.py script, it is a very simple script, it simply uh, opens this force coefficients dot dat and then plots the values of drag and lift coefficients from there, it simply extracts that. Okay. Um, I can um, easily run this. Um, so let us say uh, python plots.py and then um, it generates this plot which has uh, the lift and drag coefficients. You can, from the lift coefficient you can see that uh, the lift coefficient is oscillating and that is typically you can use uh, to extract the frequency of oscillation. So then um, I have a script called uh, um, struhal. And when you um, run it, uh, it plots the energy spectrum, uh, but uh, you can also look at uh, the script. Um, well, energy spectrum has the information about this. So if you zoom into this peak, these are uh, you know, frequency peaks. So if I just put my mouse here, it says the x value is 0 0.156. It's a, it's a 0.156 hertz is the frequency of uh, that oscillation that I am getting. Okay. Um, it also shows me uh, the value printed here. So I can extract this value now, I can put it anywhere, just a second. Uh, if I go back to my plots, I zoom into it, uh, you can check this one uh, bottom, uh, one valley at uh, on the top right, you can actually see the value of x coordinate, it is not that big. It says a 34.11 second and the next one appears somewhere here, which is 39.95, so that is around 40. So it is a difference of 6 seconds, so time uh, the um, uh, the uh, time uh, step is, uh, I mean the, the wavelength sort of is in space is uh, 6 seconds. Okay. So the time period is sorry, time period is 6 seconds. So if you divide 1 divided by 6, you get around 0 0.156 uh, hertz. So that is typically what you extracted. So you do not have to do it things manually, these are done by scripts for you. Okay. Uh, so that is uh, pretty much it for today. Um,
So let me, my laptop is about to die, so let's quickly 